So, uh, Jean-Pierre, Jean-Pierre Changeux uh, was going to be this afternoon at the, at the table ronde and, uh, and react, react to the day for unforeseen reasons. He will not be able to be, uh, to be here with us. So he very kindly uh, proposed to make his remarks, uh, his remarks now. And I think uh, we, want to, we want to welcome him. We know that he's a great neurobiologist, Jean-Pierre. Uh, great neurobiologist, but also a pioneer in this domain we're discussing about today. Welcome, Jean-Pierre. Thank you very much. First of all, I enjoy very much this uh, meeting. Um, even though uh, some uh, aspects I may not like too much. Um, the first is the notion of discipline, because uh, from the beginning, uh, there is a distinction in the program, you can see it, between, uh, for instance, neuroscience um, and uh, uh, philosophy, I would add uh, math, physics, and so on and so forth. So I think this is uh, a cleavage between uh, I would say working groups, uh, which are using different disciplines, uh, techniques, different uh, specialized knowledge. And uh, uh, I may say that uh, to cleave them, uh, give, uh, following Bourdieu, some kind of uh, symbolic power. And uh, I may say that uh, this is against what all of us want to do, which is to share knowledge and contribute to a common understanding of uh, one object, which is the uh, piece of art, or whatever you like to call it. Now, I would uh, like also to criticize one word in the program, which is um, interdisciplinary. This is uh, mm -hmm. interdisciplinarity. Uh, I am not the first to criticize the use of the word, because Althusser did that quite a while ago. And uh, to uh, uh, my knowledge, this is uh, very misleading because uh, uh, it would mean that we have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, some kind of knowledge which is beyond uh, the disciplinarity and beyond the technique, beyond the method, beyond the knowledge, and um, uh, which uh, also would tend to uh, share some uh, lower level kind of knowledge. So I prefer uh, the term multidisciplinarity. And uh, this is a big difference in the uh, sense that each one can preserve and confront his own knowledge, experience, method, and techniques without losing of its competence. So uh, it is a sharing, and uh, I would say, cooperation uh, between uh, different uh, methods, technique, knowledge. So uh, there is uh, perhaps even, uh, I would call it an ethics of uh, multidisciplinarity, which is, uh, I would say, a mutual respect between the disciplines and also a wish to cooperate, uh, which would be at the origin of a constructive kind of, not only dialogue, but sharing of experience. And this goes with uh, an important philosophical concept, which is, uh, uh, has been much debated, which is the unity of knowledge, in the sense that uh, what is true in one discipline, using the word, is also true in another one, and that we have to try to understand ourselves and build a common attitude. So this is, a, I would say, a comeback to the encyclopedia and the enlightenment. And uh, to my view, this is a, a very essential attitude. And uh, we should not talk about two cultures or conflict uh, between, um, for instance, neuroesthetics and philosophy, as it was said. I am strongly against that. But uh, uh, on the opposite, we should again respect the multiplicity, diversity of cultures, and uh, have a positive attitude. So I dislike also in the uh, program 
neuroesthétique, nom de guerre. So what does it mean? It means from the start that there is a political attitude of the organizers. I'm sorry to be a little bit uh, critical, which is to say that um, uh, those who are doing neuroscience are against the humanities, which is absolutely untrue uh, from the start. And at least my own personal attitude has also always uh, been to try to abolish this kind of distinction, but on the opposite, to share in the past uh, 15 or 20 years uh, the knowledge of the neuroscientists with the one of art historians and eventually philosophers. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, the neuroesthetic word, which has been created by maybe Semir Zeki or somebody else, should never be used again, because it, I think it is uh, what I would call an homme de paille. You know what it is in philosophy? It is a straw man. It is something which does not exist, but that one constructs to fight against it. So uh, I think uh, this is my view about the word neuroesthetic, uh, which, uh, uh, of course, if it is uh, used as a non de guerre, uh, to my opinion, is something really to eliminate from our vocabulary. To uh, replace, I think, the conflict uh, that uh, seem to exist, I would say that uh, one should have a better dialogue between experimental science and theoretical science. And philosophy is about something that we may call a theoretical science. And there would be then a very interesting exam exchange as it exists in physics between theoretical physics and experimental physics. And I have a high respect for the philosopher in the sense that uh, they may bring us as experimental scientists some issues which are actually discussed this morning, uh, that, uh, uh, in fact, we should uh, all try uh, to answer and to uh, uh, make progress. So I would leave, finally make two comments, in addition to those which I hope are not too destructive, but on the opposite uh, are in the direction of more cooperation, if you understand what I want to say. And uh, the question is, what is a piece of art? This was discussed. Um, and I think it's not clear at all. Uh, because if you look at um, art historians, and if you look at uh, the history of art history, you can realize that uh, from the 19th century up to now, they have completely divergent point of views, even if some artists which I am interested in uh, from the 16th to the 17th century in France. And uh, the transition between the Ecole de Fontainebleau and the uh, classical art of, uh, of Poussin uh, has been, in Dimier's book, for instance, uh, considered as a completely bad work uh, without aesthetic qualities and so on and so forth. And now it is something that many of us like very much. So I would say that there is uh, uh, something which is relatively uh, relative to the definition of the piece of art. And I like the relation aesthetic, because it means that there is a, a lot of subjectivity in uh, uh, the designation of a, an object or something, or I would say an artifact, because all pieces of art are artifacts in the definition as being a piece of art. And I would just uh, like to conclude. In, uh, I had some slides, but it's too late to show them. Uh, if you want, I may show them. Uh, one quality that maybe we could discuss together, um, because I think the issue of reward, as uh, point on, uh, Margaret, is a, a very difficult point to make, because um, how do you distinguish between, uh, let's say, uh, the, the reward you uh, you get when you've finally 
find your way to go to the this room, you know, and uh, <laughs> the the uh, emotion you you feel when you look at uh, uh, a Rodko painting. Let's put it this way. So um, I think we have really to further discuss this because I think this is yeah. from a, a dialogue and what kind of experiments will help us as neuroscientists to try to identify what's going on and, and conversing. And um, I just want to throw in the discussion one aspect, which is uh, what Alberti called the um, consensus partium, which is um, the so-called harmony between the part and, and the whole. And uh, if you look from uh, Lasco to Rothko through Poussin and Monet, you realize that a piece of art is a construction, is a composition, and the word composition means that things are created to match with each other within the piece of art, and there might be a neuroscience of, uh, of uh, consensus partium, which actually can be tested experimentally. Sorry for Thank being you. so long. Thank you. Um, I think we have uh, an half an hour of discussion. I'd just like to say something, if I may. Please. <laughs> I'd just like to say something in response to your comments. I thank you for them. Um, about the word neuroesthetics, which is a, which is not a nice word. We are agreed. Why? So why we use it? Because I think we have to admit that neuroesthetics, as such, is something that make, is participates in the debate, and we have also to deal with this fact as a cultural fact. And then I think we can completely agree about multidisciplinarity and the limit of interdisciplinarity. But neuroesthetics is something that is perceived as as a cultural object. We can discuss if that's. Uh, why and how and if this is uh, something that just like a, a, a problem of advertising, uh, it can be. But I, ha I think we have really to deal with that, also with that, not just with that. This is the reason why we choose to use this word and to give this title at the first part of our, of our um, uh, colloquium. So, if the, please. Thank you. Just a, a couple of uh, clarification. Can you say your name and Alessandro Pignocchi. A couple of uh, clarification question for Jean-Marie Schaeffer. Uh, just I, I was wondering whether um, all kinds of uh, satisfaction, pleasure, or reasons that can brings us to artwork uh, qualify as a consequence or com a component of aesthetic experience in your sense, or are there? Uh, Classical, uh, common reason, kinds of pleasure, etc., that do not, that because they, they, they violate one of your criteria, that do not qualify as, as uh, aesthetic. And my, my second question will depend on your answer. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't think that uh, I talked about criteria. I, I and I, I would also. Uh, uh, not answer to uh, your question, but uh, take it up. The, the, the problem is, of course, to. And that's also your question. Can we have a distinctive uh, characteristic which would allow us to distinguish aesthetic satisfaction from other types of satisfaction? My first answer would be that I am not sure that there exists something which would be specifically aesthetic satisfaction. I would rather say that there are ways of how um, hedonic value is computed, which we find in aesthetic experience and which we don't perhaps find outside of it. One of the, perhaps one of the differences, but that, that's Reba's uh, idea, is that um, whereas when I find a place into my room, the satisfaction uh, manifests itself at the outcome. Ah, I found it. And Reba's idea is that uh, in an aesthetic relationship, the satisfaction is um, ongoing and uh, during the process of uh, information uh, processing, which uh, his idea was, that he, it was the Kantian idea also already, that you have a sort of feedback between an instant, I think it's called instant utility, 
by some psychologists. The idea of not a utility being calculated as, as the outcome or uh, projected in the future, but um, getting fed in in the activity you are doing uh, all the time. Uh, so it w would be aesthetic uh, satisfaction would be one species of that, mm -hmm. that type of uh, satisfaction which is f functioning in a feedback with another activity. In this place, it would be an attentional activity. And it would be the, um, the, the fact that you have on one, time, on one, play, uh, one side mm -hmm. attention and on the other side uh, sort of specific dynamics of the relationship between reward and that activity. That would mean that you could have the same relationship between a reward and another activity, but it wouldn't be aesthetic because the activity wouldn't be attentional. And you could have um, satis satisfaction uh, produced by something which could in some other context function as an aesthetic object, because, which wouldn't qualify as an aesthetic satisfaction because it has not the really the, yeah, the, the proper uh, dynamics. Mm. So it, the two, I think, things have to come together. I don't know if that is answering your yeah. question. Yeah, so, so for instance, if I, I appreciate a, a drawing, for instance, because I am myself a draftsman and I'm impressed by the economy of gesture and the precision, and I have the impression that by looking at, I don't know, a Schiller drawing, I'm learning to draw myself. Or, I appreciate to read Proust. It, it's quite hard. It's not so pleasing, but I have the impression to learn to read, for instance, or uh, learning something. I, I, I could imagine all the intermediary cases between a completely self-rewarding yeah. stuff or so, something. And the, 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 the question would be, oh, uh, what, what is the, the, the next step in your work? Like to, to go beyond and w w will, will, you, uh, will you try to make a thinner distinction, more fine-grained oh. distinction? among the category of aesthetic experience or I, I like would to distinguish, I don't know, I, we are two, mm -hmm. per, two, two person in front of the same watercolor. Mm -hmm. One of them, one like him because it remember uh, some pleasant memory of place where he was <laughs> when he was a child and the other like the elegance of the gesture, for instance, or something. There are so many reasons that... Yes, but, but the reasons, that's another problem. The reasons are fed in into the process of looking at okay. it. So I, I would distinguish between the reasons that feed, and cultural reasons are a very important factor that, that, that feeds into, and, but I, I did only speak of this small sort of mechanics, uh, which is only part, I think, of the whole process. So it, it, I tried to define sort of prototype, but it's, and, okay, uh, it's, it's a not a definition in terms of sufficient and necessary reasons. It's only sort of picture. Uh, just one word about uh, the feedback. Mm. Um, you are looking at the individual, uh, of the subject, either mm. the, the one who perceives or the one who creates. But I think there is a fundamental issue, which is intersubjectivity. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is not only an individual reward, but a shared reward. Yeah, of course. And when you talk about the uh, uh, simplicity of shape or... Uh, uh, of uh, means and so on. I think it's, it's typically a communication between the artist, artist and the viewer. And I think this dimension has to be taken into consideration to my opinion. I'm sure perhaps mm -hmm. uh, Margaret will also share this, this view, but uh, I don't know, maybe not. But um, uh, in the sense that uh, um, this perhaps also creates uh, a particular dimension of, uh, of aesthetics as being a mean of communication which existed uh, very early on mm -hmm. in uh, human societies, uh, which was to some extent in parallel or even in competition with language, in the sense that uh, uh, the, uh, may, the aesthetic perception may be more global in the sense that you don't have to explain everything, but you communicate something which is as you say, mm. uh, some kind of reward, but which is shared. Look, look at uh, uh, the, the society without writing, Société Sans Écriture, mm -hmm. they are using a lot of what we call aesthetic communication, mm -hmm. even they may not call it aesthetic yeah. themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Merci. Euh, Ce n'est pas vraiment une question... Euh, euh, je ne sais pas si je peux le demander, mais puisque Jean-Pierre Changeux a parlé de diapositives, enfin qu'il avait euh, des éléments à montrer, est-ce que ce serait possible de voir euh, ce que vous aviez prévu Parce, euh, Enfin, je ne sais pas, euh, c'est aux organisateurs. Euh... Trois diapositives. Ok. Parce que, euh, bon, d'une part, je trouve ça euh, intéressant et dommage que nous ne vous ayons pas euh, ce soir. Euh, donc, peut-être que la table ronde pourrait s'élargir ce soir euh, aux questions qu'on aurait posées ce matin et qu'on n'aura pas l'occasion de, de poser pour que Jean-Pierre Changeux, qui, en, qui oui, amène... Tout à fait d'accord. Pardon Je suis d'accord pour vous montrer. Deux minutes, c'est juste pour euh, euh, parler du... C'est de l'autre côté, voilà. Du consensus partium, illustrer euh, cette notion avec, euh, avec Matisse... Peut-être qu'il y a d'autres questions entre temps. Peut-être qu'il y a d'autres questions. Si... Pendant que je... Il y a d'autres questions pendant que Jean-Pierre Changeux... Voilà, il y en a une qui est là-bas. Juste pour illustrer euh, euh, la, la notion de consensus partium euh, avec euh, ce tableau du, de Matisse au musée de Baltimore. Et il se trouve que Matisse a photographier les diverses étapes de la création de ce euh, tableau et ces euh, photographies existent euh, euh, au musée de Baltimore elles sont présentées en même temps et je pense que c'est quand même extrêmement intéressant euh, de, de suivre euh, I should speak English to follow the, the uh, uh, artists throughout all these different steps and uh, show that uh, Uh, when we look at the end product, we cannot believe that the other ones are by Matisse himself. You know, it's amazing how <laughs> awkward they look. And, and then progressively, they, they reach uh, this uh, final state, which is this one. So uh, it means that uh, the artist has been looking for something. And um, uh, I think this can be studied experimentally since we talk about the relationship between uh, neuroscientists and uh, uh, art historian or philosophers. Uh, and uh, you have a, just another example, uh, which is uh, 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 also by Matisse, which uh, maybe in fact before, let's go back, um, which is uh, Here, a very nice uh, painting, which is uh, uh, La Blues Romaine. And um, uh, I remember also that Diderot called uh, uh, beauty as uh, uh, perception des rapports. C'est la définition que Diderot donne du beau. Enfin, C'est une définition que certains auteurs n'acceptent pas parmi toutes les définitions qu'on peut donner du beau. Mais elle est intéressante parce qu'elle est en accord avec cette, euh, cette idée. Et vous avez ici aussi une, une série. You have here a, a set of uh, paintings which were uh, done by uh, Matisse uh, from the beginning to the end. So we have to think about that. That's it. No more. <laughs> Merci pour cette image. Je pense qu'on peut entendre la dernière question qui voulait être posée. Et après, on, on, on se salue pour la, pour la pause déjeuner. On va se revoir à 14h et on va ouvrir la discussion de, qui suivra la table ronde finale aussi pour répondre aux questions qui n'ont pas eu le temps d'être posées cette matin. Je vous en prie.
Uh, yes, just two, excuse me, just uh, two brief clarifying points. Uh, Dr. Livingstone, I was fascinated by your analysis of the preponderance of dyslexics in the visual arts, whether or not they have strabismus. So I'm wondering, this seems to be partially attributed to some kind of deficiency in the wear uh, visual pathway. Is there also a corresponding enhancement in the, in the um, what visual pathway? So you spoke it's, of a deficiency. It's a I, I don't yeah. like the word deficiency. Okay. I prefer difference. Okay. I mean, I'm not trying to be politically correct. Yeah. I just think people are different. And, and our culture has evolved to make certain things difficult for some people. But okay. no, I don't think there's a timing difference in the what pathway. I think it's more quite, quite isolated to the to the where pathway. So there's been no uh, corresponding adaptation or enhancement in the in the what in the what pathway in response well, to. Well, maybe being a really good artist is a. <coughs> uh, no one has seen one. This is hard to do. All we found was a timing difference in the where pathway, and we did it with evoked potentials. Other people have seen anatomical differences on MRI, but always in the dorsal pathway. Okay. <laughs> and then just one last question for Dr. Vidal. I didn't get the, the last question you asked concerning uh, this uh, differential um, response of the, 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 um, the amygdala's differential response with respect to spatial frequency, or I wasn't quite sure what that last question concerned. My last question? Yeah, there is an impressionist painting uh, response of the, 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 um, the amygdala response differentially with respect to oh, differences oh, 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 in spatial that frequency. That was no, that was that was just simply that was just simply a quotation from a quotation from an article, okay. which which I gave as an example, and th this allows me to say something to, to Jean Pierre Changeux's uh, commentaries, because um, I think. Jean-Pierre, you, you, you are aware that this has been organized in exactly the same spirit as at was, at, at was what you brought. But there is a difference between the ideal and the reality. And the reality is, as, as Chiara said, that there are a certain number of tensions and our use of certain words uh, was designed, was intended to open up uh, the question around those, those tensions and the possible pathways pathways for, um, uh, uh, for getting to a more interesting and a richer mode of collaboration. So it's worked, uh, as your commentaries um, uh, showed. But um, the quotation was intended just to uh, instantiate um, a kind of direction that I think is not, that I think is not promising, uh, that I think is not promising, which is to, which, which aims at explaining the effect of works of art that are extremely complex, that themselves have uh, uh, given rise to complex reactions across time whose value has changed in simple neurobiological, in simple neurobiological terms. Um, uh, in this particular case, it was, okay, so impressionism works because you have an experiment that shows that if you show, if you show faces that express fear, mm, and you show a sharp, sharp image, and then a somewhat blurry uh, version of the same, and then a very blurry version of the same. Uh, the amygdala reacts. The brain, the emotional center, the emotion centers of the brain. Let's put it that way. React most strongly to the blurry image uh, of the face expressing fear than you know than to the other two two versions. Um, so the idea here, the suggestion here was. Well, why does impressionism work? Well, impressionism works because it's blurry, and it, not only because it's blurry, but because blurry images connect directly to the emotional centers of the brain. I mean, you know, we could spend hours uh, maybe discussing this point. Maybe this is part of the phenomenon, but there are many, you know, but, but impressionism you know, has worked in very different ways across time. You know, uh, there are many, many things that work uh, and re give rise to emotions that are perfectly sharp. I mean, you know, this is, th so that was just the purpose of that quotation. And to say that the proposal, you know, the, the reason why we wanted to, um, um, you know, to discuss these things here today is because we're convinced that there are other more interesting paths in the direction, of course, of what Jean Pierre. I don't know if there are more interesting paths, but. Uh, what I want to say is that I share fully your, your point, but it's not, 
uh, unique to the relationship between uh, aesthetics and the brain. No, of course. You know, uh, this kind of, uh, of issue is the notion of uh, explanation. You know, the yeah. word, uh, one, exper one experience explains the brain. You know, so this is something which uh, we find in your science itself without even going to neuroaesthetics uh, using the word. <laughs> Uh, for instance, the relationship between genes and behavior is an issue which is extremely important for, for neuroscience today. And the tendency is one gene, one behavior. Uh, like uh, uh, one gene, one enzyme, which work with the yeast, but doesn't work with human beings for one reason, which is uh, obvious to everybody, is the uh, level of organization of the human body and the human brain on top of that. Uh, which means that we have to establish a relationship between levels of organization. And uh, uh, we have to think about the relationship between, I would say, beauty and the brain in those terms. That, uh, uh, the, and the difficulty is to assign uh, a given behavior or perception to one level. In fact, sometimes it's multi-level. You have to go from the retina properties to the primary vision area, as you beautifully showed, to up to the conscious access, including the prefrontal cortex and, and the other uh, systems in the brain. So we, that's the, the difficulty and, I, and the challenge. And I can tell you that uh, it's not for today, but <laughs> well, it's and maybe this is precisely the uh, beautiful thing we have to uh, conclude on is that we have to join our effort to progress on uh, in this field. Well, thank you, Jean-Pierre. Thank you to uh, Margaret Livingston and Jean-Pierre uh, Jean-Marie Schaeffer. Uh, we'll convene again in the afternoon at 2.